Welcome Advent brothers and sisters on the Third Angel's Message. We thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us. And we would like to ask you to just take the time to sit down, listen or watch as we study God's Word together. Before we go into the study of God's Word though, we would like to open with a thought for consideration. A prayer thought. And that is going to be taken from Councils to Writers, page 37 and page 25. We have many lessons to learn and many, many to unlearn. God and heaven alone are infallible. Those who think they will never have to give up a cherished view, never have occasion to change an opinion, will be disappointed. As long as we hold to our own ideas and opinions with determined persistency, we cannot have the unity for which Christ prayed. Inspiration says here that we have many lessons to learn, but many, many to unlearn. What could possibly be the many, many lessons that we have to unlearn? And when inspiration says that those who think that they will never have to give up a cherished opinion or view and never have to change will be disappointed. Don't fall into the class, brethren, where you are disappointed because you refuse to change the views that you already have. Let us kneel for a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are truly thankful for the opportunity that thou hast given us to study thy word. We thank thee for sending thy son Jesus to shed his blood for us. And we pray, dear Father, that thy spirit now may open our hearts and our understanding to all truths. And when we are convicted of it, that we may follow in the paths of righteousness. Again, we thank thee and invite thy spirit to be with us as we study. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. 144,000. That is a number that does not have any meaning outside the Christian circle. If you say 144,000 to someone, they won't know 144,000 what? What are you talking about? But to all present truth believers, all who are on the faith of the third angel messages, Dare say all who are on the Christianity always wonder who are the 144,000? What is their role? What do they do? Where do they come from? What do they do? Why are they called servants of God? We're going to attempt to answer those questions during the course of this study so that you have a rock solid understanding of the 144,000. But before we do that, we're going to read two statements from inspiration that are going to seem to be conflicting. Let's look at one selected messages, page 174, and see what the servant of the Lord says to us there. It is not his plan that his people shall present something which they have to suppose, which is not taught in the word. It is not his will that they shall get into controversy over questions which will not help them spiritually, such as, who is to compose the 144,000? This those who are the elect of God will in a short time know without question. Now, many times this is read whenever a conversation of the 144,000 comes up in Advent circles. But be weary of exactly what this says and don't take it any farther than it needs to go. Because she's actually saying that the question that we do not need to concern ourselves with is who is to compose the 144,000. That is not the design or purpose of this ministry to try to identify who the 144,000 are. Our purpose is to know where they come from, what they do, how are they sealed. And we're going to look at that and several other questions as we go through this study. But now there's another statement in Review and Herald, March 9th, 1905, paragraph 4. And listen to what this statement says. Let us strive with all the power that God has given us to be among the 144,000. Now, on initial basis... It would seem as though those two statements are conflicting. But it is not of any purpose for inspiration to say to us, don't concern yourself with who the 144,000 are, and then in the next breath say, or in the different writings say, that we should strive to be among the 144,000. How can you be among the 144,000 if you know nothing about the 144,000? Where they come from, what their work and purpose is. 
We need to have those questions answered in order for us to strive to be among the 144,000. So in order to do that effectively, let's turn our Bibles to Revelation 7, verses 1 through 4, and get a picture of the 144,000. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Now every time this is read, there are so many questions that come up, because the reading here opens a lot of questions. But let's go to a graphic representation of Revelation 7 and see if not we cannot picture more clearly what's going on here. It says, let me get my Bible, that John saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. And as they were standing on the four corners of the earth, it said that they were holding these four winds so that they shouldn't blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then John sees another angel coming out of the east, and he has in his hand a seal. And that seal is to seal someone or some people. It goes on to say in verse 3 that that angel says, Hurt not, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So this angel has a seal that is to seal the 144,000, as it says in verse 4. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at four winds that are being held, and if those winds should let loose, and if the angels that are sent to hurt should be let loose to hurt, then the 144,000 would not and could not effectively be sealed. Now, if you've had this study or studies in Daniel, you know that winds in many instances represents strife and war. As a matter of fact, let's go to Daniel chapter 7, verses 2 and 3, and there we read the following. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Now, when we have this study in Daniel, you know, we're studying the beasts. These beasts came about because there was war going on amongst the nations. And so Babylon, Medo-Persia, Grecia, and Rome all came about as, as a result of turmoil, fighting that was going on from one nation to the next. But these winds in Revelation 7 are different. There's nothing stopping the winds from clashing against each other. That is not the problem, brethren. The problem is that if those winds are let loose, the 144,000 cannot be sealed. So whatever it is that these winds represent, it would prevent the 144,000 from being sealed. And the servant or the angel who is actually sealing says, hold, do not harm or let the winds loose until the 144,000 are sealed. That's these four angels. But there are another set of angels who are sent by the Lord to hurt the enemies of God. And the angel also tells them, halt, hold up. Don't do anything until the servants of God are sealed. So we need to find out specifically what do these winds represent and why, if they are let loose, could not the 144,000 be sealed. Let's turn to Testimonies to the Church, volume 5, page 152, and there we will see with crystal clarity exactly what those four winds represent. There we read the following. 
The time is coming when we cannot sell at any price. The decree will soon go forth prohibiting men to buy or sell of any man save him that hath the mark of the beast. We came near having this realized in California a short time since, but this was only the threatening of the blowing of the four winds. As yet, they are held by the four angels. We are not just ready. There is a work yet to be done, and then the angels will be bidden to let go that the four winds may blow upon the earth. That will be a decisive time for God's children, a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Now is our opportunity to work. So, brethren, what does the servant of the Lord say here? She says the decree will soon go forth prohibiting men to buy and sell, save him that hath the mark of the beast. And she said, we, said, we came near having this. This what? These winds are the mark of the beast. We came near having this decree realized in California a short time since. But this was only the threatening of the blowing of the four winds. Do you see how that ties in beautifully? If the four winds are let loose, brethren, if the mark of the beast is let loose, the 144,000 could not possibly be sealed. That's why the angel is saying, hold, don't let the four winds go. Hold, do not hurt the angels that are sent by the Lord to hurt the enemies of God. Hold, let the 144,000 be sealed first before you do anything. But listen to what she says, though. She says, we're not yet ready. Now, that should touch us someplace within here. That we're not just ready. Now, if we weren't ready in her time, you think we're ready now? <laughs> Brethren, we're far from ready, as we're going to discover further uh, as we go on in the study. But she says that there's yet a work to be done. That is definitely true as we look around at what's going on with our blessed Advent church. And then the angels are going to be bidden to let go. And the four winds blow upon the earth. So you have earth, sea, and tree. Everything is going to be affected. And that will be a decisive time for God's people. What did she say? A time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. So you have here a very important conflict that you may not have seen this before. You have four angels that are holding the winds. But brethren, you have four angels that are being sent to hurt by the Lord, to, set, to hurt the enemies of God. Do, do you see that? So if you have four angels that are said to hold and four angels that are going to hurt, what do you have here? You have the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. The great and dreadful day of the Lord. What makes it great? Revelation 14, 9 to 10. When judgment comes upon uh, God's people. What makes it dreadful? Revelation 13, 15 and 16. When the mark of the beast is let loose. Here you're looking in Revelation 7. You're looking at Daniel 12. A time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. What's the difference between the time of trouble here and the great tribulation that happened in Matthew 24? The difference is in Matthew 24, the saints were slain. Here, the saints are going to be sealed and saved. But now, what of this angel that's coming from the east? He has in his hand a seal. And that seal is specifically for the purpose of sealing the 144,000. What does the seal represent? Now, where did 144,000 come from, brother? Do they not come from Israel? Now, as Israelites, are they already keeping the Sabbath? You see, the Sabbath is not their issue. It's not their issue. They do not need to keep the Sabbath in order to be sealed. They are already keeping the Sabbath because they are part of Israel. They say they could not be sealed unless they were already keeping the Sabbath. So we need to look a little bit deeper to see what is it that the 144,000 need to be sealed with that would protect them from the mark of the beast. Because if they're sealed, they're protected. There's nothing that can come against them. Let's find out what a seal is. Now, let me ask this question. Every time you see seal in the scriptures, would you think that it would, you'd have the Sabbath attached to it? You see, if every time we saw a seal in the scriptures, then the Sabbath was someplace near, nearby, then we would know specifically that the Sabbath is this seal. Is the Sabbath a seal? Oh, most definitely. The fourth commandment of the Decalogue is most definitely the seal of the living God. But is it this seal here that the 144,000 need? Let's turn to Ephesians 1, 13, and read about the seal. There we read, 
in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So who does the sealing, brethren? The Holy Spirit. Is not one of the functions of the Holy Spirit to guide into all truth? Let's not stop here. Go to Ephesians 4.30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So who does the sealing? The Holy Spirit. What is he sealing to here? Unto the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit is what seals because it is not just in Paul's day or the days of the early apostles, the early Christians, that sealing was taking place. God's people have been sealed since Adam and Eve. The sealing has been going on. And certainly we could not say just blanket that the Sabbath is a seal. It is truth that seals God's people. So it is a message that is coming to seal God's people. This is why the angel is ascending. So from the time that the 144,000 or the information about the 144,000 is now given to God's people, then that angel will be making his ascent. And whatever message he is bringing is getting closer and closer, brighter and brighter as he gets closer to doing his duty. So that means that whatever he has in his hand, it must be able to seal them with truth. So the seal will always be truth in any particular period of time. God's people are sealed with Bible truth by the Holy Spirit. Where do the 144,000 come from? It was said that they come from Israel, but who is Israel? Let's turn to volume 9 of the testimonies, page 164, and look at this statement, and you will clearly see who Israel is today. Listen to this statement. In order to be purified and to remain pure, Seventh-day Adventists must have the Holy Spirit in their hearts and in their homes. The Lord has given me light that when the Israel of today humble themselves before him and cleanse the soul temple from all defilement, he will hear their prayers in behalf of the sick and will bless in the use of his remedies for disease. So brethren, who is modern Israel? Who is the Israel of today? The Seventh-day Adventist church. Does that surprise you that we are the Israel of today? There are three distinct characteristics that Israel of today must have. It is no two ways about it. There's no getting around it. Three distinct characteristics. All of them are within the Seventh-day Adventist church. Some other peoples may have one or two, but no one else on the planet has these three distinct characteristics. Number one, they love the Lord. <laughs> Loving the Lord is number one, numero uno. If you don't love Jesus, you could never be a part of anything that he's doing. So that clearly disqualifies Israel after the flesh, those who identify themselves as born Israelites. Number two, they keep the Sabbath. Number three, and very important, they have the sanctuary truth. They understand what's happening in the heavenly sanctuary. So the only people on earth that this qualifies for is the seventh Day Adventist Church. Brethren, did you realize that the Lord was speaking um, through John about you and I when he mentioned this prophecy? Let's link this now with Revelation 14, 1 and 4 to get a further idea, further characteristics of the 144,000. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. And with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now these are some beautiful characteristics that the 144,000 have here. And I just have to highlight just a few of them so that we understand who and what the 144,000 are. Look at the 144,000 were standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Who's the Lamb, brethren? Of course our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is the Lamb. So you have to disqualify Israel after the flesh. 
because they just don't even acknowledge that Christ even came, much less that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who did come, is God. So that disqualifies them. It also goes on to say that these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. This has nothing to do with sexuality. This just has to do with the fact that they're not defiled with women. Women is another symbol that the Lord uses to define characteristics for his church. And the Lord uses many symbols. A woman, sometimes a battle axe, sometimes a chariot, sometimes uh, horses. So whatever the Lord is trying to get across to his people, he uses the appropriate symbol. And it says that they are virgins which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, as well as the fact that they are first fruits. Let's deal with the virgins part of this and see what does that mean, that they are virgins. It, again, doesn't have anything to do with sexuality, but let's turn to Christ Object Lessons, page 406, and see what the servant of the Lord tells us there. There we read... The two classes of watches represent the two classes who profess to be waiting for their Lord. They are called virgins because they profess a pure faith. Now, if you should turn to Christ's Object Lessons and read the whole chapter, you will see that it is speaking about the ten virgins, but the application still applies here because virgins, the terminology just means that those who are virgins profess a pure faith. But it also calls the 144,000 first fruits. And sometimes when I'm giving this study, people confuse the first fruits of the, the 144,000 being first fruits with first fruits of the dead. Now let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20 and read a passage there and clear up our understanding because we need to know whether or not the 144,000 are dead saints or living saints. Let's see. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So if the 144,000 are called first fruits, are they the first fruits of them that slept? Or are they living saints? Let's pick up on this in Desire of Ages, pages 7, 86. And let's follow up on 1 Corinthians 15, 20, because we really need to know whether or not the 144,000 are dead saints or living saints. There we read the following statement. So Christ the first fruits represented the great spiritual harvest to be gathered for the kingdom of God. His resurrection is the type and pledge of the resurrection of all the righteous dead. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. As Christ arose, he brought from the grave a multitude of captives. The earthquake at his death had rent open their graves, and when he arose, they came forth with him. They were those who had been co-laborers with God, and who at the cost of their lives had borne testimony to the truth. Now they were to be witnesses for him who had raised them from the dead." So Christ's resurrection is a type and pledge of the resurrection of all the righteous dead. But now, are the 144,000 dead saints? Since the terminology first fruits is used, are they living saints? Are they a combination of dead saints and living saints? Do they live during our time or have they lived from time past and now the Lord is going to do some miraculous work to gather the 144,000 and bring them and make them servants of God. Let's turn to early writings, pages 14 and 50. While I was praying at the family altar, the Holy Ghost fell upon me, and I seemed to be rising higher and higher, far above the dark world. I turned to look for the Advent people in the world, but could not find them. When a voice said to me, look again. And look a little higher. At this I raised my eyes and saw a straight and narrow path cast up high above the world. On this path the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was at the farther end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which an angel told me was the midnight cry. This light shone all along the path and gave light for their feet so that they might not stumble. If they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, who was just before them, leading them to the city, they were safe. But soon some grew weary and said the city was a great way off, and they expected to have entered it before. 
Then Jesus would encourage them by raising his glorious right arm. And from his arm came a light which waved over the Advent band. And they shouted, Hallelujah! Others rashly denied the light behind them and said that it was not God that had led them out so far. The light behind them went out, leaving their feet in perfect darkness, and they stumbled and lost sight of the mark and of Jesus, and fell off the path down into the dark and wicked world below. Soon we heard the voice of God like many waters, which gave us the day and hour of Jesus' coming. The living saints, 144,000 in number, knew and understood the voice while the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake. The 144,000 were all sealed and perfectly united. Who? The Advent people. Not anybody else. She saw the Advent people going up a path. And that path was made to symbolize the struggles that they were going through as they traveled up the path. Christ was before them. The dark and wicked world was behind them. Some now grew weary, she says, and said, this is, Christ hadn't led us out this far. And some stumbled and fell off the path down into the dark and wicked world below. And then she mentioned that they heard the day and hour of Jesus coming and that the living saints, 144,000 in number, knew and understood the voice while the wicked thought it was thunder and an earthquake. So you see, brethren, the 144,000 are not dead saints. They are living saints. They are alive. They go through some trouble, which we will identify. We've already identified the, the mark of the beast, but that's not the trouble that the 144,000 don't have to worry about the mark of the beast. That's why they're sealed. But there are many things that they do have to experience. And what the Lord is telling us here is that the 144,000 are living saints. They do not taste death. Are the 144,000 literal or symbolic? Look at Revelation 7, 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and tongues and people stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So here the 144,000 are separated because now you have the great multitude that is mentioned. The great multitude is an unnumbered company. No man could number them. The great multitude is unnumbered. The 144,000 are numbered. Let me say that again. The great multitude is unnumbered. They could not be numbered. The 144,000 are numbered. Now let's ask a question. How many seals are there? Yes, there's six. How many trumpets are there? Yes, there are nine. Of course not, brethren. There are not six seals and nine trumpets. There's seven seals and seven trumpets. Now, the information surrounding the seals and the trumpets are in symbolic language. We're going to have that study. Look for that study because we have that ready for you. But there's just the number that the Lord says. Numbers play a big part in the scriptures. So if the Lord says seven, it's seven. It's only when the Lord uses a symbolic number, which the 144,000 is not a symbolic number, that then we need to look further into the meaning of what the Lord is speaking about. What will happen to those that are not sealed? Let's turn to Testimonies to Ministers, page 445, and there we're going to see a very interesting statement from the pen of inspiration. There we read the following. This sealing of the servants of God is the same that was shown to Ezekiel in vision. John also had been a witness of this most startling revelation. Brethren, do you get that? John and Ezekiel both saw the sealing of the servants of God. Now we know where John saw the sealing of the 144,000. But where did Ezekiel see the sealing of the 144,000? Can you remember where Ezekiel saw that? You know, when I first had this study, I said, well, where did Ezekiel see the seeing of 144,000? Before we go there and give you the answer, let's turn to Testimonies for the Church, Volume 3, page 266 and 267. 
the true people of God who have the spirit of the work of the Lord and the salvation of souls at heart will ever view sin in its real sinful character. They will always be on the side of faithful and plain dealing with sins which easily beset the people of God, especially in the closing work for the church in the sealing time of the 144,000 who are to stand without fault before the throne of God will they feel most deeply the wrongs of God's professed people. This is forcibly set forth by the prophet's illustration of the last work under the figure of the men, each having a slaughter weapon in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen, with a rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Who are standing in the council of God at this time? Is it those who virtually excuse wrongs among the professed people of God and who murmur in their hearts, if not openly, against those who will reprove sin? Is it those who take their stand against them and sympathize with those who commit wrong? No, indeed, unless they repent and leave the work of Satan in oppressing those who have the burden of the work and in holding up the hands of sinners in Zion, they will never receive the mark of God's sealing approval. They will fall in the general destruction of the wicked, represented by the work of the five men bearing slaughter weapons. Mark this point with care. Those who receive the pure mark of truth, wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost, represented by a mark by the man in linen, are those that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the church. Their love for purity and the honor and glory of God is such, and they have so clear a view of the exceeding sinfulness of sin that they are represented as being in agony, even sighing and crying. Read the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. Now, brethren, if that does not quicken your spirit, if that does not cause you to think and reflect then, brethren, it may very well be that you are steeped in Laodiceanism. And I say that with all the compassion that I can, because this is not Ellen White speaking. This is the servant of the Lord, or the Lord speaking through his servant. She's speaking on the inspiration. Let's go back and highlight a few of the statements so that we can really get a clear view of what we're seeing here. It's serious. She says that when the closing work for the church is in the sealing time of the 144,000, what did you think the closing work for the church was? Did you think it was a thousand days of reaping? Did you think it was uh, the evangelistic series that we have going on? That, what did you think it was? Were you aware that this is the closing work for the church? Have you ever read this before? She goes on to say that this is forcibly set forth by the prophet's illustration of the last work on the men, each having a slaughter weapon in his hand. So whatever those angels are coming to do, brethren, it's serious. Inspiration goes on to say that they will fall in the general destruction of the wicked represented by the work of the five men bearing slaughter weapons. The reason why it's called a general destruction is because the destruction begins somewhere, begins in the church. But where does it conclude? In Babylon. And the church is definitely not Babylon. So understand that there's a lot of things going on here that we need to keep in mind. Especially this. Mark this point with care. Those who receive the pure mark of truth. What do you think that this angel has in his hand? He has a seal in his hand. The pure mark of truth. Wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost. We're right on track, brethren. That seal being brought by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is what seals. Represented by a mark by the man in linen are those that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the world. Brethren, go back and read it. It says in the church. This is not even bringing the world into this at all. The Lord says in order to receive the seal, in order for the 144,000 to be sealed before the winds are let loose, 
that you and I have to sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the church. Are you not aware that the abomination is going on in our beloved church now? We don't have time to get into all the abominations that are going on. But brethren, let it not be said that you and I are participating in the abominations. Because if we are, we will never receive the pure mark of truth. And then she tells us where Ezekiel saw the sealing of the servants of God in Ezekiel 9. So let's turn our Bibles, brethren, to Ezekiel chapter 9. He cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north. And every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a rider's inkhorn by his side. And they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. And he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. And to others he said in mine hearing, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spear, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin in my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house, and fill the courts with the slain. Go ye forth, and they went forth and slew in the city. And it came to pass, while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, O oh Lord God, wilt thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Then said he unto me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceeding great, and the land is full of blood, and the city full of perverseness. For they say, The Lord hath forsaken the earth, and the Lord seeth not. And as for me also, mine eye shall not spear, neither will I have pity, but I will recompense their way upon their head. And behold, the man clothed with linen, which had the inkhorn by his side, reported the matter, saying, I have done as thou hast commanded me. We must highlight a few verses here so that you can get what the Lord is trying to get into your heart and into your mind right now. Look again at verse 2. Because it says there that six men came from the way of the higher gate which lie towards the north. And every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. So the Lord sent these men. Now, don't confuse six with seven. Don't say that this is the plagues which some people, some of, unfortunately, some of our, our leaders will tell you that. But don't you go for that, brethren. The Lord can count. If you can count, the Lord can count. Six is different from seven. But look again in verse 2. It says, And one man among them was clothed with linen, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, or a seal. What's he going to do? He's going to mark. He's going to seal. The very same thing we see in Daniel, I'm sorry, in Revelation 7. Look at verse 3. And the glory of the God of who? Israel was gone up from the cherub where he upon he was to the threshold of the house. So this angel came to Israel. Not Israel after the flesh which we see over in Palestine. But Israel after the spirit. He was at the threshold of the house brethren. And the warning is going out to you right now. Look at verse 4. It says, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. Where is Babylon mentioned anywhere in Ezekiel? The, the, the chapter that it came out of is the Laodicean church. We are the Laodicean church. It says, and set a mark upon the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Get this, brethren. Don't let this pass you by. This is your opportunity now to do exactly what the Lord says. It says, to slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women. That's everybody. Everybody who is not sealed. Brethren, this is serious. You, you've got to warn our brethren. We have got to warn our brethren that this is about to take place. It goes on to say, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. That's 144,000, brethren. And begin at my sanctuary. Would you take that to mean the world? Would you take that to mean Babylon? My sanctuary? 
Of course not, brethren. Then they began at the ancient men. Those who should be warning us about this, that's where the Lord says to begin. Look at verse 8. And it came to pass, while they were slaying them, and I was left, that I fell upon my face and cried and said, Our Lord God, will thou destroy all the residue of Israel in thy pouring out of thy fury upon Jerusalem? Would you say, would anyone dare to say that Israel and Jerusalem is Babylon? Oh no, brethren, Babylon is not mentioned here. So just erase, eliminate, discard that thought at this very moment. This is not speaking of Babylon. Why would the Lord have to do such a thing within his beloved church? Of course, the church is the apple of his eye, and he regards it with high esteem. But something must be going on amongst us, brethren, that the Lord has to say, I, this has to stop. I have to make, I have to purify my people in order for the work to be finished. What's going on, brethren? Turn to Christ's Object Lessons, page 316. There we're going to read something that is going to startle you because you may not have read it before. But prepare yourself for this because from here on in the study, the Lord is showing you and I our spiritual condition and how far off the mark we are. And where we need to come up to in order for the Lord to identify us as servants of God. Listen to what the Lord says through his servant in Christ's Object Lessons, page 316. Many who call themselves Christians are mere human moralists. They have refused the gift which alone could enable them to honor Christ by representing him to the world. The work of the Holy Spirit is to them a strange work. They are not doers of the word. The heavenly principles that distinguish those who are one with Christ from those who are one with the world have become almost indistinguishable. The professed followers of Christ are no longer a separate and peculiar people. The line of demarcation is indistinct. The people are subordinating themselves to the world, to its practices, its customs, its selfishness. The church has gone over to the world in transgression of the law. When the world should have come over to the church in obedience to the law. Daily, the church is being converted to the world. Brethren, that is almost a horrible statement for the Lord to make about you and I. That daily we are being converted to the world? Do you understand the implications of that? What the, what the servant of the Lord is saying here? Do you think that it's just an isolated statement that we are not doers of the word? We're, that we're mere professors, mere talkers. The Lord doesn't want anybody who's a talker. He wants people who are distinguishable from the practices of the world. And the Lord is saying as far as he's looking at us now, that that's not taking place at all. The professed followers of God are no longer separate and peculiar people. We're to be peculiar, not weird. But we're supposed to be peculiar so that we can be set apart, set aside. When, when people see us and they, they, they come in contact with us, they understand and know that these are the servants of God. That is what it means by peculiar. It also goes on to say that the church is subordinating itself to the world, its practices and its customs, its selfishness. Brethren, we're in bad shape. This is a serious situation. The church has gone over to the world in transgression of the law when the world should have come over to the church in obedience to it. No wonder the Lord could only find 144,000, brethren. How many did he have to have in the flood? Eight. How many in Gideon? 300. How many, how many left Sodom and Gomorrah? You understand, brethren, that the Lord can only work with a few. Let that few be you and I. So where does judgment begin, brethren? You might think that this judgment is, is well, why would it start here? What does 1 Peter 4, 17 say? It says, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. So you and I, brethren, are in more danger than those who are out in the world. Why? Because the Lord expects more from us than from anybody else. Judgment begins at the house of God. You and I are on warning. We're on alert that the Lord is about to make a clean work among his people. But some individuals like to say that this is symbolic, my brother. The Lord is not going to do this. This is not literal. It's just a picture that the Lord is showing of the shaking and the shifting. Really? 
Let's turn to manuscript release number one, page 260, and see exactly whether the servant of the Lord tells us this is literal or symbolic. Let's read the following. Study the ninth chapter of Ezekiel. These words will be literally fulfilled. Yet the time is passing and the people are asleep. They refuse to humble their souls and to be converted. Not a great while longer will the Lord bear with the people who have such great and important truths revealed to them, but who refuse to bring these truths into their individual experience. The time is short. God is calling. Will you hear? Will you receive his message? Will you be converted before it is too late? Soon, very soon, every case will be decided for eternity. She says in no uncertain terms, these words will be literally fulfilled. Let no one tell you that this is not to happen, that Ezekiel 9 is not to happen to God's people. Let's pick up on the literalness of this by going to volume 5 of the testimonies, page 210 and 211. The class who do not feel grieved over their own spiritual declension, nor mourn over the sins of others, will be left without the seal of God. The Lord commissions his messengers, the men with slaughtering weapons in their hands. Go ye after him through the city, and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids and little children, and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. Here we see that the church, the Lord's sanctuary, was the first to feel the stroke of the wrath of God. The ancient men, those to whom God had given great light and who had stood as guardians of the spiritual interests of the people, had betrayed their trust. They had taken the position that we need not look for miracles and the marked manifestation of God's power as in former days. Times have changed. These words strengthen their unbelief, and they say, The Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. He is too merciful to visit his people in judgment. Thus, peace and safety is a cry from men who will never again lift up their voice like a trumpet to show God's people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. These dumb dogs that would not bark are the ones who feel the just vengeance of an offended God. Men, maidens, and little children all perish together. The abominations for which the faithful ones were sighing and crying were all that could be discerned by finite eyes. But by far the worst sins, those which provoke the jealousy of the pure and holy God, were unrevealed. The servant of the Lord says here that the church is the first to feel the stroke of the wrath of God. Just as we read in 1 Peter 4.17. This is no, nothing to pass over. This is nothing to take lightly. She says the ancient men, those whom God had given great light, had, had just betrayed their trust. Of course that's true, brethren. You're not hearing this from the pulpit. And why do they say this? Because they say that the, they take the position that we need not look for miracles and the manifestation of God's powers in former days. They say times have changed. Brethren, you'd be amazed. I've heard that with my own ears when, when, when I've read this. She calls them dumb dogs. If you have a dog and someone's breaking into your home and that dog doesn't warn you, what use is that dog unless it's an apartment dog or a show dog or something like that and then you don't have the dog for warning you? But that's not what our ministers are there for. The ministers are there to warn you and I that destruction is about to come on the house of God and these are the preparations that need to be made. The Lord is talking to you and to me. But he's reaching us in the only way he can possibly reach us, through men and women who are prepared to take this message to them. But listen to this. He says that men, maidens, everybody perishes. Nobody is safe, brethren. The Lord, just like he had to clean up Israel when Achan sinned, well, clean up, destroyed everyone in Achan's household, rather. You think that the Lord is not going to do the same thing today when there's so much at stake? When the rest of the world is depending on the Seventh-day Adventist church to do their work, they don't even know that. But you don't know it either. 
these 144,000 are sealed for sighing and crying for all the abominations that are done in the church. How are you going to sigh and cry? How are you going to be sealed if you don't even know what to sigh and cry about? How are you going to be sealed if you don't even know that a message has come in order to purify the church? You couldn't possibly be part of 144,000. You could never be amongst their numbers because you don't know what to do. But you know now. Let's turn to another statement in volume two of the testimonies, page 337. And listen to this statement. You may have heard it before, but you didn't know where it was. It's in volume two, 337, that this statement appears. Men and women are in the last hours of probation and yet are careless and stupid. And preachers have no power to arouse them. They are asleep themselves, sleeping ministers preaching to a sleeping people. Do you imagine that the Lord is saying through his servant that we're stupid? Do you like being called stupid? (laughs) I know I don't like being called stupid. No one likes to be called stupid. But the Lord through his servant is saying that we're stupid because he's trying to get something across to us, but yet we would ignore it as though it doesn't even exist and pass it by and not even read the word of God, not even pick up the testimonies, not even read any portion of it, in order to understand what the Lord would have us to do right now. And we think that everything is fine. Everything, we're, we're on our way to glory. Everything is good. We're bringing them in by the droves. They're coming in all over the world. Brother, we're kidding ourselves. Kidding ourselves. When she says that preachers have no power to arouse them because they're sleeping preachers preaching to sleeping people. And all the signs are revealing that the time is near. Everything around the world, everything in the planet, everything is happening. And Adventists, we would go to church, brethren, sit down, listen to, to something that, oh, you, you know, you're the basic gospel and not be warned of the impending danger and doom that is about to come upon our, our, our people, upon our church. And no one is saying anything. And you would expect that the Lord is not going to raise up men and women to sound the alarm. If you thought that, you thought wrong. The Lord has a people, and they are raising their voice, and you're hearing it right now. And you need to take some decided action. Don't look at anybody sitting next to you. The Lord is speaking to you. You are hearing it. It doesn't matter who's next to you or who's listening or who's watching. It doesn't matter. Either you can hear the voice of the Lord or you cannot hear it. Are the 144,000 ever going to taste death? Because we called them living saints earlier in the study. But where can we find some backup, some, some actual solid, a solid reference for that? Let's go to Prophets and Kings, page 227. Elijah was a type of the saints who will be living on the earth at the time of the second advent of Christ and who will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump without tasting of death. That is why, in early writings 14 and 15, the servant of the Lord called them living saints. And Elijah was their type. Did Elijah die? No. He was translated without seeing death. The 144,000, being the antitypical Elijahs, are also to be translated without seeing death. There's something else that's interesting about the 144,000 that inspiration mentions in early writings, pages 16 and 17. And let's read that because we still have a company to consider here. The 144,000 we dealt with, but now we need to deal with the great multitude. But listen to this statement and then let's discuss it. Here on the sea of glass, the 144,000 stood in a perfect square. Some of them had very bright crowns, others not so bright. Some crowns appeared heavy with stars, while others had but few. All were perfectly satisfied with their crowns, and they were all clothed with a glorious white mantle from their shoulders to their feet. Now, interestingly enough, the servant of the Lord says here that the 144,000 had crowns, and on their crowns they all had stars. Well, let's see exactly what relationship the 144,000 have to the great multitude, why the 144,000 have stars in their crowns, and they're perfectly satisfied with their crowns. Let's look at the relationship between the two and see whether or not the great multitude are redeemed from all ages, or are they those who are living, are they translated as well? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 7, 
verses 9 through 14. And there we read the following. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So here we're seeing that they are from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And one elder asked, Well, who are these, and where did they come from? He said that these are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Which great tribulation did they come out of? Well, let's look. Let's turn to Revelation 7, 16 and 17. But before we even go there, the great tribulation is really clear, because they came out of the tribulation of the four winds. That is obvious because the four winds were not only being held back so that the 144,000 could be sealed, but once the 144,000 were sealed, then the mark of the beast is let loose. A time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. But it goes on to give even more clues as to who the great multitude are. Look at verse 16 and 17. There it says... Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. Now, brethren, what does that give you? That gives you some several clues right there. Not only do they go through the great tribulation of the mark of the beast, but also they go through the fourth plague, where no sun and no heat lies on them. Isn't this amazing? See, the, the, the scripture is very clear in giving us the clues along the way to identify not only the 144,000, but the great multitude as well. Now, what happens or what is the relationship between the 144,000 and the great multitude? Now this, I'm sure if you have not read this before in Isaiah 66, it is going to be totally new to you. Because when I first read it, I said, wow, that is absolutely amazing. I've never seen that before. But look at the relationship of the 144,000 to the great multitude. For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariot like a whirlwind, to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire and by his sword will the Lord plead with all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. So here we're seeing in Revelation and in Isaiah that the slain of the Lord shall be many because the Lord is going to come with a great tumult. And the slain of the Lord shall be many. What does that mean? That means the same thing that it meant in Ezekiel 9. That there's going to be a slaying. There's going to be a purification. And from that, the Lord is going to have a people. But let's go on further and let's see what Isaiah has to say. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. For I know their works. And their thoughts. It shall come that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. And I will set a sign among them, and I will send those that escape of them unto the nations, to Tarshish, Pull and Lud, that draw the bow to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar off, that have not heard my fame, neither have seen my glory. And they shall declare my glory among the Gentiles. And they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord, out of all nations, 
upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain Jerusalem saith the Lord as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord I can only say praise God to this look at what's going on here brethren this is totally unlike anything that you have understood. The relationship of the 144,000 to the great multitude is that the 144,000 gather the great multitude. Because it says in verse 18, And it shall come to pass that I will gather them out of all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. But in verse 19 it says, And I will set a sign among them. What's the sign? The purification. And I will send those that escape of them. Who's that? The 144,000. Where are they going? Unto the nations, to Tarshish, Pool, Lud, that draw the boat to Tubal and Javan, to the isles afar off, the places that have not seen my, heard my fame and seen my glory, and declare my name among the Gentiles. This certainly couldn't be in the earth made new. There are no Gentiles in the earth made new. Not at all. And what will they do? They will bring all of your brethren. They will bring who? All of your brethren. The great multitude. For an offering unto the Lord out of all nations upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules and upon swift beasts. Hey, brethren, what we're doing now that, can, that, that we consider, what the church as a whole is doing that's considering harvesting and gathering people. But brethren, that is not the program that the Lord has. The Lord says the church first needs to be purified. I need to gather my servants who are going to serve me in this capacity, in an evangelical capacity. They are going to bring their brethren out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people and bring them to God's holy mountain. Now, it's interesting to note, brethren, that many times when this study is given, people think that, well, where did you guys come up with this? Where, where did you get this from? Where did you, brethren, uh, you know, wh what is this? Where did it come from? Well, just to let you know that this was taught by our church. In the sign of the times, and we have this article, which you can pick it up on the internet. When you go to the internet, you can download this. But you can download two articles. One was written June 20th, 1950 by Taylor G. Bunch. It's called First Fruits of Redemption's Harvest. And the second one was written even earlier than that. May 3rd, 1927. The 144,000, their triumphs and reward. And it goes over exactly what the 144,000 relationship is to the great multitude that the 144,000 come from the Advent Church what they do, what they need to, to be the type of spiritual deportment and spirituality they need to have it was taught by our church the 144,000 are said to be without fault or without blemish which is the language used in describing all first fruits they must be the first in both time and quality, the best and chief fruits of the field or vineyard. The first fruits have been defined as the fruit or product first matured and collected in any season. Matured is from the Latin maturus meaning ripe, a full age, perfected by time or natural growth, brought to perfection, completed, prepared, ready. The 144,000 are the first to be brought to perfection of character in the gospel harvest of the last generation. They reach mature growth and are sealed and given the Holy Spirit in latter rain showers, the purpose of which is to call the innumerable company of God's people out of spiritual Babylon before God's wrath is poured out upon the rejectors of his grace in the seven last plagues. First Fruits of Redemption's Harvest by Taylor G. Bunch, Sign of the Times, June 20th, 1950. Don't think that this was just pulled out of a hat. The church was teaching this at one time, but no longer. The church is going off into, you know, whatever it is they're teaching now, but this was something that the church was very familiar with and very well aware of. Let's turn, as we close up, to a statement in Early Writings, page 33, and understand that this phenomena, is all I could call it, of the 144,000 gathering the great multitude, is highlighted in inspiration as well in other places. Let's look at one or two of them. In 
Councils to Teachers, page 532. Listen to this statement. The message of the renewing power of God's grace will be carried to every country and clime until the truth shall belt the world. Of the number of them that shall be sealed will be those who have come from every nation and kindred and tongue and people. From every country will be gathered men and women who will stand before the throne of God and before the Lamb crying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. But before this work can be accomplished, we must experience here in our own country the work of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts. Brother, I don't know how much clearer this could possibly be, but the Lord is saying to us that, listen, this is my plan. This is my program. The message, the renewing power of God's grace will be carried where? To every country and climb until the truth shall belt the earth. What do you think the 144,000 is designed to do? Why they call servants of God? They take the third angel's message to the entire world with no encumbrances whatsoever. She goes on to say clearly, of the number of them that shall be sealed will be those who have come from every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. From every country will be gathered men and women who stand before the throne of God and before the Lamb, crying salvation to our God. Is there a type for the great multitude? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. And let's answer it by going to Early Writings, page 40, and then to Patriots and Prophets, page 88 and 89. I was taken to a world which had seven moons. There I saw good old Enoch, who had been translated. On his right arm he bore a glorious palm, and on each leaf was written, Victory. Now do you see that, brother? Do you see that the very same thing that the great multitude had which was a glorious palm leaf, and on each was written victory, is the same thing that Enoch has. And Enoch was translated without seeing death. So we got a little clue here that the great multitude are the antitype of Enoch. But let's go to Patriots and Prophets, page 89 and 90, and there we will read the following. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. In the midst of a world by its iniquity doomed to destruction, Enoch lived a life of such close communion with God that he was not permitted to fall under the power of death. The godly character of this prophet represents the state of holiness which must be attained by those who shall be redeemed from the earth at the time of Christ's second advent. Then, as in the world before the flood, iniquity will prevail. Following the promptings of their corrupt hearts and the teachings of a deceptive philosophy, men will rebel against the authority of heaven. But like Enoch, God's people will seek for purity of heart and conformity to his will until they shall reflect the likeness of Christ. Like Enoch, they will warn the world of the Lord's second coming and of the judgments to be visited upon transgression. And by their holy conversation and example, they will condemn the sins of the ungodly. As Enoch was translated to heaven before the destruction of the world by water, so the living righteous will be translated from the earth before its destruction by fire. So do you get that, brethren? Enoch lived a life of such purity that God did not allow him to fall under the condemnation of death. But it goes on to say that Enoch is translated to heaven and that the living righteous will be translated from the earth before its destruction by fire, just like Enoch was translated. It goes on to say, though, that those who are living at this time again are represented, these are some people, will be represented by Enoch. What does that mean? Why are there two types of those who are to be translated? Because we just read that Elijah was a type of the 144,000, and now we're reading that Enoch is a type of the great multitude. Why two types? Very simple. Enoch was not an Israelite. Elijah was. <laughs> actually is. Both of them, actually. Because Enoch was not, is Enoch still alive? And so is Elijah. But he, do you get that? Enoch was not an Israelite. He was translated before Israel even existed. Elijah was an Israelite. So you have the 144,000 represented by Elijah, or they're represented by Elijah, and the great multitude represented by Enoch. 
That's beautiful. Do you think that heaven identifies those who are to be translated and those who are to be resurrected? Do you think that heaven makes a distinction between the two? Let's close up our study by going to Great Controversy, page 665. And there we read the following statement. Nearest the throne are those who were once zealous in the cause of Satan, but who, plucked as brands from the burning, have followed their Savior with deep, intense devotion. Next are those who perfected Christian characters in the midst of falsehood and infidelity, those who honored the law of God when the Christian world declared it void, and the millions of all ages who were martyred for their faith. And beyond is the great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now here you have four classes of the redeemed outlined. Now let's see what those four classes are. You have those who are nearest the throne. Those who were once zealous in the cause of Satan, but who plucked his brands from the burning, have followed their Savior with deep, intense devotion. Who would that be, brother? None other than 144,000. If they're standing nearest the throne, couldn't be anyone else but 144,000. Then, number two, you have those who perfected Christian characters in the midst of falsehood and infidelity. So now you have a second class. Then you have the millions of all ages who were martyred. And last, but certainly not least, you have the great multitude. So here you have four classes of the redeemed, brethren. The 144,000, a class that perfected Christian characters, another class that were martyred, and the great multitude. So the great multitude are not among the martyred class. They're not those who have been resurrected. They are those who have lived during the time of the mark of the beast. During the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. They are alive as well as the 144,000 because the 144,000 gather them. The Lord is saying to us through Revelation 7, if we do not sigh and cry for the abominations that are being done in his beloved church, we will not be sealed. We thank you so much, brethren, for taking the time to study with us. We hope to be seeing you around soon as we, we visit around, because we will be visiting around uh, the, the, the country. And we hope to see you at some of our meetings as we go to share this precious truth with our brethren. Thank you, and God bless.